Hey everyone, my name is Raymond, for those of you who don't know me. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the thinking processes behind TOC. So uh, the core idea behind theory of constraints is that even really complicated systems can be reduced to finding like key leverage points, right, for constraints in those systems. Um, and there's, there's some kind of broad uh, techniques you can use to think about systems to kind of come up with like, how you identify what those leverage points are and then how you attack them in a big organization and ultimately affect the change. Um, it's not going to be too long of a talk, and at the end, we're going to kind of break up into the groups, and we're going to talk about what's an initiative that you've had. Not everybody has to share, but hopefully at least one or two people in each group can share. What's an initiative in your organization? And has it actually attacked the constraint? Right? Or has it been something that really was attacking a non-constraint? And we'll talk about what that means. So as we're going through this, think about, for your own organization, uh, what are some examples of initiatives you've had and how they relate to kind of this paradigm. Now, I'll explain that as we get a look. Get. So the first thing is that you have to make a change, right? But I think we all know that not every change you make is an improvement, right? And certainly managers who, you know, somebody comes in and say, hey, we have to change this, we have to change this, we have to change this. This is like the first thing they're thinking about, right? Is whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy there. Let's not disrupt, you know, the nice order we have, right? With changes that I'm not sure are going to help anything. So what's crucially important, right, is that at the beginning we understand what to change, right? If what we're changing is not affecting a constraint in the system, then what's the effect going to be? Right? Nothing, or very little. Please. Right, the next question is, okay, if we know what we want to fix, like we have a really good understanding of the cause and effect behind the problem, what are we going to change to? What are going to be the new rules? What are going to be the new policies? What are we going to change? What are we going to buy? What are we going to sell? Right? What to change to? And finally, it's going to be how we cause the change. Because even if we have a great understanding, we deconstructed the problem, we know what the path forward is, but we're in a big organization. Big organizations are hard to change a lot of times. In alignment, you have to be able to describe the problem really well, you have to build a consensus, right? People are going to have all sorts of concerns you need to take into account, right? And then you're going to have to manage the implementation of that change. So that's this final step, what to change to, I mean, how to cause the change. So if we break that down a little further, these are the things I'm just going to summarize today. And then we're going to think about, for initiatives you've had in your organization, where, where in this process did we break? right? Or did we not break at all? Did we take it all the way to the end and we moved the needle and got kind of business level results? So the first part is what to change. Right? So, did we identify a major issue, uh, a major issue in our company that was really hard to fix? This is represented by a vicious cycle. Normally there's some situation we're in, we all know it's bad, but we can't get out of it. And it, you know, like one example I could give is uh, if you're a company and you make and sell products, maybe sales are down, right? You have less money to invest in new product development. Right, so you're still trying to put out maybe 20 new products a year, but you have like half the staff on each of them, right? And maybe your quality of new products is suffering, right? What's that going to do to your sales? Right? It's going to further drive them down, right? Because you're putting poor quality products on the market, they're not going to sell this well. Right? That is a vicious cycle, which could be at the core of like what's affecting your company's bottom line. And it's also a vicious cycle that's really hard to get out of. Right? Like, where are you going to make enough money to invest in new product development when your company is cash poor? Right? That's not usually something that is easy. Right? And so that gets us to the next part, which is the core conflict. 
right? So normally, if you're in a big organization, there's a lot of smart people in it that are struggling with the problem of how do we manage this and get better results every day, right? And they're going to be wrestling with whatever this vicious cycle is all the time. If there were an easy way out of it, people would have done it already, like 99% of the time. Sometimes there's some low-hanging fruit, and you just think, oh, we never thought about it this way. It's easy. A lot of times there's a real struggle. Right, like you're stuck between two things. I'm cash poor, right, and I don't have the money to invest, but I know I need to invest and have good products. And the only way you're going to get out of that is if you come up with some kind of innovation, right? How can we both have, you know, make the need of bringing a compelling product to the market, but also not go bankrupt in the process of doing that? And I, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is to that particular situation because I just made it up and I don't know, right? But, but that's you have to have real innovation to fix that in, in whatever your company is, right? Does that resonate with people? <laughs> Who thinks, everybody kind of takes some time, we'll do, a, we'll do a talk about this later, like in small groups, but who, kind of think of a, one of the, like the most major change in your organization, that your organi whatever organization you're in, think about one of the most major changes you've made recently. Was it clear to you what, what it was attacking and whether or not that was a constraint? Who thinks it was? Some people, it's okay. Who thinks it, it wasn't clear that this was a major initiative and it wasn't clear how it was going to move the needle? That's some. Okay, it's about half and half. People are <laughs> okay, so the, the next step is what to change to, right? So if we have a good understanding of the cause and effect, right, and we have a good understanding of how we can break out of some negative cycle that we've been in that's keeping us from kind of hitting that next level, we need, to, we need to be able to say directionally these are the changes we're making to break us out of this vicious cycle, right? Then whatever we come up with as this is the path forward, there's going to be negative consequences. Like there's going to be some negative things that maybe we didn't anticipate. Maybe some of our customers are going to be upset with this, right? Maybe some of our suppliers are going to be upset with this. Maybe certain departments are going to get hit negatively from this, right? Each of those you have to address for this to move forward, right? So that's the refining the solution. Um, and then you have to understand what are all the, like, to, to achieve these major objectives, what are all the sub-objectives that we need? Right, because normally the direction of a solution will be not something you can take and go implement, right? Some kind of broad strategic vision with a few important considerations, right? But to get this down to the, you know, to where teams can go take it and run with it, you need to usually define, okay, to hit this strategy, we're going to do this tactic and this tactic and this tactic. To hit this tactic, we need to do these five things, right? And then the final thing is how to cause the change. And I'll tell you, you know, talking to a lot of people who've done TOC for many years, a lot of times this is the hardest part. Right, because you can have done all of this really well, right? but people may not see it your way. They may not be bought in that this is the problem. Right? They may have big negatives that they think whatever you've put forward is the solution is not going to fix. Right? So how do you get a, a, whole, a whole organization and kind of key leaders in that organization to be bought in on the change? Um, if you don't do that well, it really doesn't matter how well you did everything before it, because you're not going to affect any change in the organization. Unless you're the owner, in which case this is going to be a little easier. <laughs> Your company that's buying is very easy. Um, finally, you have to manage what are, you know, the changes you want to make in a plan, uh, and then course correct, because things never go fully as we plan. At least none of the things I've done. So these are the steps, and, and kind of the thought is, is that um, we're not going to go into any of these in, in terrible detail today, right? But as we have like progressive meetings, we'll cover one of these in detail, and we'll do specific examples. And then we can kind of brainstorm on how you would fix it, and we can show you how whatever company it was, you know, addressed it and 
in actuality, not even to say that it's right. So this is just the visual of kind of what we just put up there, but these are the, you know, what to change, what to change to, and how to cause the change. And I'm gonna do this, no justice at all, but duties, right? These are all the challenges, right? These are the things that are blocking us. Like when you talk to people in the organization, these are things that are keeping us from hitting our goal, right? This is the vicious cycle. This is how we understand the cause and effect between the duties, like the undesirable effects. And what's the cause and effect that ultimately prevents us from hitting our goal, right? And from that, we identify usually what's keeping us in this vicious cycle so that it's hard to break out, and that's kind of the core conflict. That's where the innovation has to happen. If we can't find a way to break ourselves out of this vicious cycle, we never will. So this is kind of what to change, and these are the tools. So sometimes you'll, you'll hear about like a, documenting all the UDs, creating a vicious cycle, doing a core conflict. Those are the tools that we have to kind of identify what to change in our organization. Right, then you identify what are the changes you actually make uh, in terms of the vicious conflict, I mean the vicious cycle, right? This is the old vicious cycle, then you have like a positive, this is how we break ourselves out of it. Hey, Ray. Yeah. How, how do you, you spend a little bit more time on how you get from the vicious cycle to the uh, uh, DAV prime on the cloud? Yeah. Uh, usually in the vicious cycle, there's going to be at least one or two steps which are uh, policy or decisions we're making in our company, right? So normally when you look at a vicious cycle, like in the case of the example I brought up with uh, like product development, right? There's gonna be things that are kind of out of your control that are pure logic, right? Like we put four people on a project and give them a short timeline to do a new, a new product, right? Whereas before we had 10 people in a much longer time. If you put fewer people and you give them less time, you're probably going to get a lower quality product. <laughs> right? So there's going to be some things you can't affect because it's like a law of nature. But there are some things you do affect. Like you chose to put four people on the project. Right? You chose to give them this much time. So usually what you look at in a vicious cycle, once you come up with the cause and effect, is what is the thing that we're actually doing? What is the part where we have control in the vicious cycle? What's our decision? So here's what I actually want to say, uh, Steve. I think when you draw the vicious cycle, we really have to look for where is it that we are exhibiting a certain type of behavior. Because a lot of these are cause and effect. Clear element that is there. Right? We behave like this. And that is what is the clue. If you can identify a box that is kind of more behavior, that will force us. Like our behavior is to assign. If we are doing like five projects, and if we have five people, and each project requires five people, but we are doing an assignment like one, 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 one. That's our behavior. Right? So it could be starting new projects before we finish. Before we, exactly. Right? What is it that is, it, it, it could be driven by metric, it could be. And those behaviors are not, and companies are not able to change those behaviors because they are living a conflict. Certain things are driving it. That is where it leads to the conflict, right? So if I'm living or exhibiting a certain behavior, why am I doing that? Right? The only reason I'm doing that is not that I, I don't know, I'm not smart enough as we hire smart people, right? But they are not able to change their behavior because every day they get that conflict. So from that behavior, if you can identify that conflict and then attack that assumption. And I think we are jumping ahead a little bit, but this is the exercise we need to do in one of these sessions. So this is supposed to be kind of just a broad overview, but it's a great question. All right, so from that, you figure out how do we break out of the vicious cycle? Right, what will the cause and effect that we described before, if we make a few key changes, what will the effects of those changes be? That's really what you're describing. And then based on that, if, if we really take time and think about what are going to be some of the unexpected, or, or maybe we're now expecting them, what are going to be the negative consequences of changing these policies? Right, and how do we address those? Right, and ultimately we want to get to to better achieve our goal. We have a few strategies we want to employ. And to do each strategy, we need to do four or five tactics. And you need to get this so that everybody knows really precisely, clearly what you're out trying to do with your organization. Right. Um, once you have this, then you have to get everybody bought in. 
right? So there's a whole buy-in process with, if, <laughs> if you go to anybody and say, hey, I have this great change, here's what you should do. What's gonna happen? <laughs> They're gonna be like, oh, hey, no. <laughs> Here are all the reasons we can't do it, right? And there, nobody's gonna say that because they want their organization to perform poorly, right? They're doing it for good reasons. They have all these good reasons in their head they're sharing with you. So part of it may be they haven't thought through all the things you have and you're assuming that these are obvious and they may not be obvious at all, right? And there may be things that they've thought of that you haven't even begun to th think of yet. They may be some of these negative consequences that you haven't considered. Right, so how do you do this whole process of getting an organization bought in and aligned and all the stakeholders aligned where it's in everybody's best interest is a big challenge. So there's two tools we use. One is kind of the change matrix, which is understanding people's motivation to change. Uh, and another is looking at layers of resistance, which is a lot of times we go to people and we say, hey, they're not bought in on the problem. They're not progressive thinking, right? They don't, they're not change agents in their organization. And the issue really isn't they're not bought in on the problem. I mean, they're not bought in on the solution. They're not bought in on the problem. Right, so understand where did they get lost in this, right? Were they with us like we've identified the real constraint? We've identified the thing we need to fix? Like, do they think we even, did we, did we bring them along there or did we lose them? Right, and so it's identifying kind of where in this whole process, every, whatever the stakeholder is we're trying to get bought in, where, where did we lose them if we lost them? <coughs> And then ultimately coming up with a plan and then course correcting. So this is just an overview. Um, I'm going to talk a little tiny bit more um, about how to identify what to change. And everybody's heard of like the Pareto principle, right? You know, 20% of the stuff is going to get you 80% of the results. And I think the way we're all inclined to think about it is we are all privy to the 20%. Right, of the high leverage stuff and we're going to do it and we're going to get 80% of the value. What we don't think about a lot of times is that maybe we're doing the 80% and we're getting 20% of the results. Because it's really hard to know what that 20% is that's going to be leverage. Right? So you have to think in a really large system, in a huge system that's wildly complicated. Right? There's not you know, 20 different levers you as a manager can pull. There's a thousand levers you can pull, right? Which one of those levers is the long lever that's going to move the needle for your organization, right? So I think that's the thing to really like. It's it's kind of humbling, right? When you first come at it, is saying actually it's really hard to identify the constraint. There's so much noise in these systems, and they're so complicated, and there's so many. If you look at all the bottoms up problems we have, how do you sift through all that and figure out the one kernel? Right, or not in, you know, the, the real focus here. So what, what are the ways we do it today? Like, let me just black this one out. How do people, like, all managers are trying to fix things in their organization today. Right, I, I described one way to go about it through the thinking processes, where you identify all the problems, you kind of figure out the root cause, why it's hard to get out of it. What are some alternatives? What are other ways to go about it? Can you describe that? Um, on marketing strengths and weaknesses, um, opportunities and trends. Yeah. Okay. Good. What are some other ones? Reinforce. Crisis management. Attack everything. Okay. Yeah. Suggestion box approach. Suggestion box. Okay. Good. So there's no one right way to go about it. I've kind of shown one way. Um, 
one thing that I've seen a lot is as organizations get farther into like firefighting mode, right? Like there's a crisis, we're not performing, we need to perform. Tends to be kind of longer lists of things to do. And no clear understanding of if I do this one thing, what this next effect is going to be. And it, it usually in the, in the crisis of firefighting, a lot of the cause and effect gets lost. Not everywhere, but a lot of times. So, I mean, I think y'all probably all been in the meeting where you say, what are all the challenges we have to get this project done? You list them all, and then you assign each one of them out to somebody on the team. You all have seen that happen? So to get through that, it, it really fundamental belief. Because like the, if there is a system that's really complicated, believing that it's simple, and saying we can really get this down to find one long lever out of everything. Like when, when your whole team comes in and you're a manager and they say these are the 12 things we need to do and you say no, 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 we're going to find one or two core things and we're going to do those really well. Right? To do those one or two things you may need to do a couple of them. Right? But it really takes a belief. Like if you don't believe that those systems are really simple, and that ultimately you can find some long lever in that whole system. The pain that it's going to take to go through and understand the cause and effect and to get to the root cause and the long lever, it won't be worth it. This is the last slide I'll cover and then we'll break up into a group. So when we're looking at what to change, the first thing we look for is what is the motivation? What is the significance of what we're trying to affect? Or like if we cannot find a vicious cycle, some hard situation we're in that's hard to get out of that everybody in the company cares about, then don't go any farther. <laughs> the next thing is we're looking for one, like one vicious cycle essentially, off a lot of the negative problems that the whole organization's gonna face. Right? Like if we can't if we can't take all the major, most of the major challenges that the organization has, and if they're not in some way related to that, that core problem, then we probably haven't picked the right one. And finally, we can't, we can't change laws of nature, right? So when we look at breaking it, we're looking for affecting like a, a behavior, a policy, or some assumption we have about doing how we do business. So uh, what I was thinking now, and we can kind of craft how we do this in future meetings, but I uh, want to have some uh, time where we all can like get in small groups and actually talk about how you apply these things to your own organization or to situations you've had in the past. Because it's really through, you can, it's one thing to listen to somebody talk about constraints. It's another thing to say, okay, what is the, what is the goal of my organization? What is the constraint to hitting that goal, to making a significant pr improvement in, in doing more of that goal? And you know, how have initiatives that we've done measured up against it? So it could be a success you share. Here was the constraint for our organization. Here's how we broke it. Here's what the results were. Could be, I haven't even thought about the constraint, but let's, let's look at this past initiative and see if it really hit it or if it didn't. So, uh, it's a little freeform, and we'll see if we need more structure for the for the future kind of small groups. 